Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnson, and today we're going to start learning about something called the derivative of a function. So what is a derivative? Well, the idea is motivated by what we talked about in the previous lecture. The idea is we have some function on the real numbers, and we want to know about its rate of change, or equivalently, about the slope of its graph. So this is something we talked about in the previous lecture, okay? We had this formula where to get the instantaneous rate of change, what you do is you take the limit of the right endpoint approaching the left endpoint of some interval, and then you compute the average rate of change over that entire interval. And in the limit, as the interval gets smaller, you're going to get the instantaneous rate of change, okay? So that formula is just copy and pasted from the previous lecture, okay? And the picture here is just what we've got down here, okay? So you've got a left endpoint of some interval, right endpoint of some interval. The interval is of width x2 minus x1, okay? And then the slope or the average rate of change over that interval is just the slope of this line segment connecting those two endpoints of the interval, okay? And that, but then as you make that interval shorter and shorter and shorter, you're gonna get closer and closer to the instantaneous rate of change. Well, we're gonna change notation a little bit here because what we wanna do is we wanna talk about the derivative function of another function, okay? So what I wanna do is, given some particular function, I don't wanna just compute the instantaneous rate of change at a point, okay? I want to compute another function with the property that that function describes the rate of change or the slope of the original function. I want to construct a whole new function out of the one that I started with so that then I can just plug numbers into it and it'll tell me about the slope of the original function that I started with. Okay, so this is just motivating a change in notation. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a couple changes here. This x1, uh, the x1, I'm gonna call that x for now on instead, okay? I'm gonna think of that as the input to my new function. And instead of labeling x2 as the right endpoint of my interval where I'm computing the average rate of change, I'm gonna label the width of the interval. I'm gonna call that h. Okay, so this is the exact same calculation, it's just different variable names on everything. Okay, so again, what I'm doing here is I'm computing a limit as the width of the interval goes to zero. Okay, so now I'm gonna update the picture at the bottom there, the width of the interval, now we're calling that h. I'm just letting the width of the interval go towards zero. Okay, and then what's happening is, again, I'm just taking the y-coordinate of the right endpoint minus the y-coordinate of the left endpoint, that's my change in y, and then divided by my change in x, divided by my width of the interval, okay? And that's all that I've got, okay? So again, it's just the limit as the width goes to zero of the average rate of change, okay? But I change notation because now what happens as I take, after I take this limit as h goes to zero, I'm not gonna have h's left over in, a, in that anymore after I compute that limit, but I will have x's left over, okay? So what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a function out of this. It's gonna be a function that depends on what the value of x is. Okay, and we denote this function by f prime of x. Okay, if our original function is f, then our derivative function is f prime. f prime, it's the function that describes how steep, what is the slope of the original function f. Okay, and again, this is, it's defined via a limit. Okay, it's not defined via average rates of change. It's defined via limits of average rates of change. So as the width of the interval gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you get closer and closer and closer to the derivative, closer and closer and closer to that instantaneous rate of change. Okay, well, actually computing derivative functions via this definitional formula, via this limit that we just saw, that's a pain, okay? If you had to use that limiting formula every single time you want to compute a derivative, you would quickly go nuts, okay? So instead, what we do is we come up with all sorts of different rules that we can use to compute derivatives more quickly, okay? And each rule is going to apply in a different situation depending on what your function looks like. Okay, so what we're gonna do in this first lecture is we're gonna introduce something called the power rule. And what it is, is this is a rule that lets you quickly and easily take the derivative of power functions. And what I mean by that is any function of the form x to the power of a constant, okay? This n up here, it has to be some fixed number. It cannot depend on x. So it has to be something like x cubed or x to the power seven, but it cannot be x to the power x. Okay, so that number n up there has to be constant. And what the power rule says is, well, if you've got any function like this, then its derivative is this guy over here. It's gonna be n times x to the power n minus one. So if your original function was x cubed, so n is three, then your derivative function is gonna be three times x to the power two. Okay, now at first, this is gonna just seem completely arbitrary. Like you look at that and you say, where did that formula come from? That, what does that have to do with anything that we just talked about?
Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna try to convince you that this is right. I'm gonna try to convince you that if your original function is x to the power n, then your derivative is nx to the n minus one. Okay, I'm gonna try to convince you of that fact. In other words, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you something called a proof. I'm gonna prove that fact now, okay? So I'm gonna show you what's going on underneath the hood here, what's going on behind the scenes. We don't have to use this anytime we wanna use the power rule. We don't have to use any of the stuff I'm gonna write down now, but this is just to convince you that it's right. It's gonna show you that I'm not making things up here. All right, so where's the power rule come from? Well, the derivative by definition is this limit as h goes to zero of you know, y difference divided by x difference, okay? So that's just copying down the definitional formula from a couple slides ago. All right, but now I'm gonna use the fact that, well, I've got a very specific type of function here. I'm not talking about any function f, I'm talking about the function that raises x to the power n. So that's all I've done here, is here I've got an f of something, well, that means something to the power n. And here I've got f of something, that means something to the power n. Okay, so I just plug in what function I'm working with. Okay, and now the only tricky part about this is here I've got a binomial raised to the power n. Well, what does that mean? That means you take that whole expression x plus h and you multiply it by itself n times, okay? So here I've got x plus h times x plus h and so on, a total of n times. There are n bracketed terms there. Okay, and now I wanna to try to start simplifying this. I wanna use one of my tricks that we talked about in a previous lecture for evaluating limits, but before I can do that, I'm gonna have to cancel out some stuff here because if I just naively plug h equals zero into this expression, I'm gonna get zero on top and zero on bottom. It's gonna be one of these zero over zero situations that I get nonsense. So I've gotta somehow simplify that before I can evaluate this limit. Okay, and here's the clever step. This is the tricky step of the proof. This is the step that's not obvious. If you expand out this product here, this x plus h times x plus h and so on times x plus h, think about what types of terms you get when you multiply that out. Well, certainly one term that I'm gonna get is x to the power n. Okay, and why is that? Well, if you think about multiplying this out, like the way you multiply out this big expression is you multiply one term from the first bracket times one of the terms from the second bracket and so on times one of the terms from each of the brackets. Well, if I just choose the x term from each of those brackets, I'm gonna get x times x times x and so on n times, and that'll get me this x to the power n term. Okay, I'm also gonna get lots of other terms though because there are also these plus h parts in this bracket. So now I'm gonna ask, well, what happens if we just take h from this first bracket, but then times x in each of the other brackets? Then I'm gonna get h times x times x times x times x. I'm gonna get h times x x to the n to the power, sorry, h times x to the power n minus one. All right, but I also get the exact same term if I do x from the first bracket, then h from the second bracket, then x, then x, then x, then x, okay? If I only do h in the second bracket, but x in all of the others, then again, I'm gonna get h times x to the power n minus one. Okay, and I can actually do that in n different ways. I can pick h from one of these n different brackets and choose x from all of the rest of them. I can do that in n different ways. I can choose h from the first bracket or h from the second bracket or h from the last bracket, okay? So I have n choices there and each one of those n choices will give me an h times x to the power n minus one term. So overall, I have h times n times x to the n minus one, right? Because I have n different ways that I can get that term. All right, so that's the hard part, hard step of this proof. The next part that I'm gonna notice is that, well, there's still more terms here. After I expand all this junk out, what if I pick two H's? What if I pick three H's? What if I pick N H's? But the point is all of the other terms after I expand that out, all of them are gonna have an H squared in them. They're gonna have at least two powers of H. Okay, and then other junk, lots of X's and H's and maybe some N's and just junk. But it, the important part is it's gonna be H squared times something. Okay, and that's important because now, once we've written out this limit in this way, now we can start canceling stuff, right? We've got an X to the power N cancels with a minus X to the power N. Okay, and after I cancel out those two terms, look at what I've got left. Everything here has an H in it. I've got an h on the bottom, that's gonna cancel with this h here, and it's gonna turn that h squared into just an h to the power one. All right, so what am I left with after I make that simplification? Well, all I'm left with, remember this x to the power n canceled with minus x to the power n, and then h is canceled everywhere. I'm just left with n x to the n minus one, and plus h times something. I don't know what that something is, I don't really care, it's just h times something involving x's and h's and so on. And now as h goes to zero, what happens? 
Well, this first term does not have an h in it, so that doesn't care that h is going to zero. The limit of that part is just that part. And then what happens to the second part as h goes to zero? Well, it goes to zero. It's h, which is going to zero, times some product and sum of x's and h's. So that term over there, I mean, maybe it's going to zero, maybe it's going to some other junk, I don't know, but you know, it's zero times something that's bounded, so it's going to zero as well. So overall, you're just left with this first term as your limit. So in other words, the derivative of that function is just n times x to the n minus one, which is what we claimed it was, right? If you go back one page, that's what we said the derivative was on this previous slide. Okay, so that's the power rule, and that's where the power rule comes from. Okay, so how do you use the power rule? How do you actually compute derivatives of these power functions now? Well, let's just do a couple quick examples. You just plug in, okay? What's the derivative of x to the power two? Well, it's just two times x, right? What is the power rule? It says the way you compute the derivative of x to the power n is you bring that exponent down out in front and then you decrease the exponent by one. That's all I've done here, right? I brought the exponent of two out in front, so now it's two times x, and I decreased the exponent by one. It used to be two, and now it's one. This is like two x to the power one. All right, and I mean, just in terms of the graph here, if I plot this function y equals x squared or f of x equals x squared, what that means, again, geometrically derivatives, they're slopes, remember. So for example, now I can take this function and plug numbers into it, and that'll tell me about the slope of this original function at different points on this graph. So if I plug in x equals one, that's gonna tell me the slope of the function at x equals one, and the slope is gonna be two times one, which is two, okay? If I do it now, if I plug in x equals two, now I'm gonna get a slope of two times two, which is four. So that tells me this tangent line, this line that comes in and barely touches the graph of the function at x equals two, it's gonna have slope four. At x equals three, it's gonna have slope six. At x equals four, it's gonna have slope eight. In general, at, at x equals x, it's gonna have slope two x. That's what the derivative means. All right, let's do a couple more examples just to make sure that we're comfortable using the power rule. Okay, what's the derivative of f of x equals x cubed? Okay, well, the, again, this is of the form x to the power n, so you just bring that exponent out in front and decrease the exponent by one, right? n times x times, or sorry, n times x to the power n minus one. So it's just gonna be three times x with one lower exponent, so three times x squared. Okay, bring the exponent out in front, decrease the exponent by one. Derivative of x to the power four plus x to the power minus three. Okay, so there are two things that are going on in this example that we haven't really talked about yet. The first is, well, here we're adding up two functions. We haven't talked about anything like this yet. It turns out this kind of doesn't matter. If you have a sum of two functions and you want to compute the derivative, well, just take the derivative of them individually and then add up those derivatives, okay? The derivatives, derivatives play nicely with sums, okay? It's what we call a linear operator, okay? So you can sort of split it up over sums like you would sort of naively do even if I didn't talk about this and it all works out, okay? So I, I can just compute the derivative of x to the power four and I can compute the derivative of x to the power minus three and then just add up my answers and I'll get the correct derivative final answer, okay? The other thing that's kind of new about this example is here I've got a negative exponent, I've got a negative n. Turns out nothing changes. You do exactly what we've been doing with positive, uh, positive integer exponents as well. Bring that minus three out in front and decrease the exponent by one. Okay, so when you do all of these things, here's what you get. X to the power four, derivative of that is four X to the power three, right? Bring the four out in front, decrease the exponent by one. Okay, and the derivative of this X to the power minus three, the minus three comes out in front. And be careful, when you decrease minus three by one, it becomes minus four right? You're doing minus three minus one, which is minus four. So that's your new exponent. All right. What about the derivative of one divided by X? Well, at first glance, this looks really weird. This is different from any of the examples that we've talked about. How is this a power function? So the first thing that you've got to realize is that yes, this is a power function, right? You can write this function here in terms of exponents. One divided by X, that's the same thing as X to the power minus one. Okay, so we know how to take derivatives of things like that. X to the power minus one, well, if I take the derivative of that, the minus one comes out in front and then I decrease the exponent down to a minus two. Okay, so that's all you've got to do. Okay, X to the power minus one becomes minus X to the power minus two. And maybe a more sane and human way of writing that is minus one over X squared, right? Remember your exponent rules. All right, another example. What about the derivative of root X? Again, that doesn't look like a power function, but the trick is basically the same as what it was in the previous example. Root of x, the square root of x, remember that's x to the power one half. 
Okay, so it is a power function. We can use the power rule on it, okay? So f of x equals x to the power one half. So the derivative of this guy, you bring the one half out in front. So that's why we get this one half here. And you decrease the exponent by one. So one half becomes minus one half. Okay, and then again, if you just write that in a bit more of a human way, it's one half x to the power minus one half, or maybe a bit more sanely, it's one over two root x. Again, remember your exponent rules to write that in a bit more of a comfortable way. All right, one final example. What about if you have something like this where it's four times x cubed plus three root x, okay? And the point here is the scalars that are out in front. How do these screw with derivatives? If I have a derivative of a number times a function, what happens to the derivative? And it turns out nothing weird happens, okay? If I wanna take the derivative of four times x cubed, well, you just take the derivative of x cubed and multiply it by four, okay? The scalar just does what you would expect to derivatives, okay? Nothing weird happens, okay? So if we just jump right down to the answer here, hopefully it makes some sort of sense. Four x cubed, well, bring the three down out in front and then decrease the exponent by one. So it's gonna become a 12 x squared. The exponent went down by one and we multiplied the four by three. All right, well, about the second term, three root x, well, we just talked about the derivative of root x being one over two root x, so just multiply that by three. So it's three over two root x, and that's all I've done there. And then you add up, you know, you got a plus in the middle, just throw a plus in the middle, okay? And everything works out. Okay, so that's all there is to it, okay? So what we're gonna do going forward from here is we're gonna see, well, what do you do if your function doesn't look like just a sum of power functions? Okay, so like for example, how do you take the derivative of sine of x? How do you take the derivative of e to the power x? How do you take the derivative of logarithms? And so on. And they each have their own derivative rule, each coming from that limit definition of the derivative. So in the future, in the next couple lectures, we're gonna talk about what are these other derivative rules and how do we use them? So I will see you soon to talk about those.